from the University of Laverne. This is Foothill Community News. Hello and welcome to a new season of Foothill Community News from the University of Laverne. I'm Taylor Moore. And I'm Olivia Mottarelli. In our news today, California's Governor Gavin Newsom has signed more than a dozen bills into law that will protect and expand abortion rights and provide greater access to reproductive health. These laws will prevent women from being legally responsible for a miscarriage, and they'll also prevent a health care provider from releasing medical information of someone seeking abortion care. Other laws will increase training for nurses to conduct abortions and provide money for low-income women seeking abortion services. Governor Newsom says he is proud to stand with abortion rights and sign these bills into law. Starting January 1st, a new state law will require California public universities to offer students the abortion pill. However, the University of Laverne will not be following in step. The abortion pill, also known as the medicine abortion, consists of two pills and is available by prescription. While the health centers at California public universities have to offer the pill, University of Laverne Health Center Director Jamie Solis says the health center here is too small with limited resources to offer the pill to students. We have one um, doctor that works here and we just don't want to put ourselves in a position where we wouldn't be able to follow up appropriately with students. The abortion pill has been on the market for more than 20 years and has been proven to be safe and effective. This Planned Parenthood video shows how one pill stops the pregnancy from growing and the second causes cramping and bleeding to empty the uterus. Although complications are rare, Solace recommends students seeking a medicine abortion see a specialist. Or somewhere where they do this all day, every day, because there are complications that can come, you know, and risks that can come with it. So we want to ensure that they would get the best care possible. Students I spoke with agreed with the center's decision not to offer the pill. We might need more resources and people to help explain it to girls, especially on our campus, since we are such a small school. Although, of course, I do wish we had it just as a last resort for girls. Here, I'm not really disappointed in it at all because one has to really understand the um, resources we have, the limited kind of resource that we have. The university's health center does offer pregnancy prevention, such as free condoms and birth control pills. Students who need resources for an abortion can go to the health center to make an off-campus appointment at a clinic. Due to the health center's small staff and limited office hours, it is likely that this decision will not change. The University of Laverne has made getting quick and accurate COVID testing easier than ever. The university has installed a COVID PCR test vending machine on campus that will frequently produce results in less than 24 hours. The vending machine is located on the first floor of the Abraham Campus Center. Access to it is restricted to those who have signed up for a shielded T3 account and individuals who have received an exposure notice or have been advised by the Student Health Center or Athletics to get tested. To learn more, visit the University of Laverne's website under COVID-19 testing guidelines. A local football game that ended in a brawl has now triggered a police investigation. The scuffle following a game between Damien High and Bishop Amont High took place on September 23rd and according to a police report, involved two Damien High coaches and a player from the opposing team. Damien head football coach Matt Bechtel has been placed on leave pending an investigation. According to Laverne Police, Bishop Amont senior Aiden Ramos filed a battery report with the department after the game. The report claims Ramos was assaulted by two Damien coaches after Bishop Amat's 35-7 victory, leaving Ramos with a bruise under his left eye. Damien High School Athletics will not comment on the incident. It was a march that led to a clash with police and the death of a Los Angeles newsman. It was the Chicano Moratorium, which took place in 1970. A stage play written decades ago recounting that tragic moment was revived last month at the Das Center for the Arts in Pomona. I went to see it and talk with those involved. For the first time since 2019, the play The Silver Dollar opened its doors to the public and to an audience eager to learn more about the Chicano Moratorium. I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good. I'm ready to get inspired right now. Written by Rene Rodriguez in 1980 and performed by Teatro Urbano, the immersive play follows the story of the Chicano Moratorium March on August 29th, 1970, where thousands of Chicanos protested the Vietnam War and the unfair treatment of Latinos. The protest ended with the killing of Los Angeles Times reporter Ruben Salazar. 
I wasn't taught this stuff in elementary, middle school, or high school, and I grew up in East LA. So I think it's important to find ways for our community to know this stuff. So come and join us. Chicano Flowers! Chicano! The one act play is a fictitious account of events that happened that day and is set inside the Silver Dollar Bar in East Los Angeles. Though honoring Salazar is a main component of the play, the late playwright's wife and producer, Rosemary Rodriguez, says her husband, who was a Vietnam veteran, also wanted to examine the experiences of Mexican Americans who served in Vietnam. Your people are nothing. They are no one. They have no culture. They felt it was important for Vietnam veterans to be able to see the play and relate to what's going on. The playwright's son, actor Rene Rodriguez, says the play also looks at issues like social justice and police abuse that are relevant today. We're still fighting for the same things that we fought for in 1970. The Chicano moratorium ended when police fired a tear gas projectile into the Silver Dollar Bar, killing Los Angeles Times reporter Ruben Salazar, who was known for writing about the civil rights struggles in the Chicano community. The Silver Dollar's three-day run played to a standing room only crowd that was multi-generational. It's a great way to showcase stuff about Chicano history. And it may sound a little cliche, but if we forget our history, if we don't revisit it, then we're obviously doomed to repeat it. According to Rosemary Rodriguez, we can expect a film version of the play in the future. Reporting for Foothill Community News, I'm Olivia Mottarelli. Well, we come back, an art exhibit with a new take on Americana and we'll tell you what's going on around the town. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. The Harris Art Gallery at the University of Laverne opened its first exhibit of the year entitled Welcome Here. Reporter Megan Mojica says the exhibit brings together multiple artists sharing their unique visions of America. Art enthusiasts came out to Harris Gallery to take in the art and hear first from two of the featured artists about the inspiration behind their work. The show features works from more than a dozen artists, including six University of Laverne art students, and highlights the artists' personal interpretations of Americana based on their geographic communities. Curator Jennifer Vanderpool says she chose artists from across the U.S. who are multi-generational and work in different mediums. And, and the idea of Americana and uh, how geography, place, immigration, family stories influences our experiences, but also influences the stories of the places, and we see that in the industry and the architecture and the pop culture. Artist Mark Batong Malake whose work looks at his experience as a first-generation Filipino-American, says being featured with other artists creates a conversation between their pieces. Like, I feel like there's this conversation happening within the work, and I think that the audience gets to participate in that as well, that they get to make visual connections between two pieces of art, three pieces of art. The exhibit's bright paintings, textured canvases, and emotional photographs were hit with the crowd, including friend and fellow artist Christopherson San Pablo. Oh, it's a good show. Yeah, a good cohesive show. Um, the work all seems to make sense together. Uh, it seems like it was curated really nicely and very thoughtful. The exhibit will run through October 27th and admission is free. Reporting live from the Harris Gallery, I'm Megan Mojica for Foothill Community News. Looking for something to do? Look no more, we have what's going on around the town. The annual Cal Poly Pomona Pumpkin Fest is back for its 30th year. Bring the family and explore corn mazes, a petting farm, hay wagon ride, and much more. There will also be games, live music, and demonstrations from Cal Poly Pomona Agricultural 
related organizations. New this year is the Pumpkin Garden with some of the most unusual pumpkins you've ever seen. The Pumpkin Fest runs until October 30th. Tickets cost $6 for adults and $5 for children 3 to 12 years old. To purchase tickets and find out more, go to Agriscapes at Cal Poly Pomona. You can also head over to Heritage Park in Laverne to pick out a pumpkin and have some fun. The Heritage Foundation's annual pumpkin patch features a petting farm, tractor pull rides, and of course, pumpkins of all sizes. The patch opens October 15th from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Hurry to catch the Twilight Cruise Night at the Pomona Fairplex. The event takes place on the first Wednesday of each month. Enjoy an evening of hot rodding, music, food vendors, and more. Cruise night hours are 5 to 8 p.m. The event is free for spectators and $5 to enter your car into the cruise. Car lovers can also check out the Via Verde Classic Car Cruise Night in San Dimas. Cruise night happens the first Friday of the month until December. Join the car community for music, vendors, trophies, raffles, and prizes. Old Town Laverne comes back alive with amazing tastes, sights, and sounds during Laverne on Tap. The event takes place on October 15th from 5 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. There will be more than 20 businesses from around the area offering samples of craft beers from local breweries and unique foods. Coming up, sports plays and game scores. We'll be right back with your local sports updates. Time to wake up. <laughs> I've got a job to do today. I've got a job to do today. Don't forget, you've got a job to do today. Hey, Mom. I got the job. <laughs> Thanks. Got the job. Welcome aboard. Your donations to Goodwill fund job training programs right in your community. Feels good to start fresh, right? Sure does. And like that, you're a job creator. Our sports reporter, Nate Rodriguez, is here to tell us what's good in sports. Nate, how are our teams doing? Well, there's been some exciting things happening the last few weeks. It's fall sports season at the University of Laverne, and the Leopards are waking up and making noise. After winning seven out of their first ten games, Laverne women's volleyball traveled to Chapman University last week and beat the Panthers in four sets, improving their record to eight and five. The women closed out September with a home game Friday night against the Caltech Beavers. Men's soccer opened conference play on September 14th in thrilling fashion. Taking on the Whittier College Poets, sophomore Joel Trejo scored a 1-0 game-winning goal in the final minutes of the match. The following week, the Leopards took on the Pomona Pitzer Sagehens at home. With the help of some fancy footwork, Trejo scored his third goal of the season in another close 1-0 win. The men's soccer team's record sits at 2-2 two two as they headed into Sunday's action against Occidental University. Women's soccer snapped a four-game losing streak against Chapman with late-game heroic efforts by the offense. Trailing one to nothing with less than three minutes to play, senior Sarah Ramirez found Alyssa Moran, who struck one home to tie the game at one. With the clock ticking down to its final seconds, Moran then found Ramirez for the game-winning goal with one last second remaining to win two to one. Laverne football played their first home game of the season against Pacific Lutheran University back on September 20th, but were shut out by the Lutes. PLU quarterback Eric Bainter completed 21 of 29 passes, throwing for 310 yards and four touchdowns. Not to mention two rushing touchdowns as well before being replaced in the middle of the third quarter. The final score at Ortmeyer, a 41-0 blowout. In local high school sports, Bonita High School squared off against rival San Dimas High in the 50th annual Smudge Pot football game back on September 10th at Citrus College. Bonita maintained their San Dimas win streak under head coach Steve Bogan, collecting their fourth consecutive Smudge Pot win, 21-13. Then, on September 22nd, 
The Bearcats traveled on the road to Claremont High School and edged out the rival Wolfpack 31 to 28. Bonita now owns a record of 4 and 2. And keep your eyes out for the Damien High School boys water polo team. The boys began the 2022 season with eight straight wins and now hold an 11 and 3 record as they try to make the CIF playoffs in back-to-back -back years. That's all for local sports. I'm Nate Rodriguez. Back to you guys. That'll do it for us. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.